very pleased to introduce you to Professor Vladimir Vansevich and he'll introduce the talk in the title. Thank you, uh, Vladimir. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, for inviting Dr. Borsic and me to the ISTVS Digital Event Series. Um, it's really happy to be here and see unlimited capabilities of the virtual world to meet with all people around the world at the same time. Uh, it's really a good event and very happy to be here. Unfortunately, Dr. Borsic cannot be here today with us due to his business duties. And on behalf of two of us, I will present uh, today's slides for our talk and we'll be happy to take uh, questions afterwards. Uh, Dr. Borsic and I uh, wanted briefly to talk about the Journal of Telemechanics before we go to the today's talk. Uh, as many of you know and uh, may recall, beginning uh, in uh, 2016, uh, the Journal of Telemechanics and the ICVS conferences established a regular session on advanced controls and artificial intelligence applications to telemechanics. And we extended uh, the scope of the journal to telemechanics and off-road dynamics of vehicles with different level of autonomy. Uh, to planetary rovers and manned, unmanned vehicles with high speeds for other celestial bodies. We extended our um, uh, scope to autonomous vehicles for motion in the ground, not only under the ground. Autonomous amphibious vehicles, underwater vehicles interacting with the bottom of the sea. The Journal of Thermomechanics already published several special issues on related topics. Uh, we regularly include um, those papers in our regular issues. Um, those uh, special issues, they were on real-time thermomechanics, autonomous vehicle mobility, energy efficiency, and many others. Uh, we will be happy to receive and manage your submissions uh, on related topics. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask today or offline or shoot me an email on Dr. Borisic and we'll be happy to answer to uh, those questions. Uh, with that, I will go to the presentation, um, what we plan to do together, but again, I will do this on my own. Autonomous mobility as a research and uh, development area is very broad. Today, we briefly summarized some of our joint publications related to autonomous vehicle mobility and discuss our approach to two major subject matters, what I'm going to show you when I share the screen. Um, I'm sharing the screen now. I hope you can see my screen now, right? So those two subject uh, matter areas, you can see it, uh, see them from the title of the presentation. One is optimization of autonomous mobility performance, and second, fundamentals that such optimization creates for UGVs, unmanned ground vehicles, specifically for autonomous control of mobility. On slide number two, uh, we posted here 11 papers or publications related to today's discussion. When you see a digit in the bracket on a slide, this digit means that a reference paper a number from this list of, present, uh, list of papers. Uh, we begin our uh, talk with a brief overview of terrain mobility of conventional vehicles with driver. Specifically for such vehicles, our interest is mobility definitions and technical approaches to modeling, simulation, and assessment of mobility. We concentrate only on those aspects of uh, modeling, simulation, and assessment uh, that can bring us to understanding specific of autonomous mobility of unmanned ground vehicles. Next, we will talk about uh, indices to assess autonomous mobility. In particular, we present mobility margins and mobility performance indices. 
We formulate a mathematical problem of mobility performance optimization and discuss its solution with application to different operational modes of vehicles and different terrains. Very briefly, we touch experimental verification of the optimization results. You can find more in our papers. Differences in vehicle energy, energy efficiency optimization and mobility performance optimization will be discussed next. This is very decisive for our discussion today, since both optimizations have been considered to be the same for many decades, many years. The usefulness of the introduced mobility optimization for tire control, slippage control, is next. And we will talk about agile tire slippage dynamics and control with um, uh, essential, for, essential features for unmanned ground vehicles. And finally, we'll make some conclusions on the topics and outcomes. Over the past 100 plus years, terrain mobility of manned ground vehicles with drivers has been defined in research in depth through mathematical analysis, computational simulation, and experimental studies. Different researchers define mobility in different ways, but nonetheless, the definitions are close to each other in principle, while they highlight different aspects of vehicle motion. On this slide, we provide three definitions which embrace three most important essentiality of mobility on soft terrain which are important for our consideration. Dr. Wong introduces mobility as a vehicle performance. Dr. Dr. Chudakov, I believe, beginning in the 1930s, differentiates topological mobility and Greek mobility. And Dr. Agakin considers mobility as a vehicle integral operational problem. Based on the keywords highlighted in those definitions, we can conventionally agree that mobility, uh, terrain mobility, is considered as the overall operational properties that characterizes vehicle ability to move from one place to another place, uh, while retaining its ability to perform its primary mission or task. We can hi highlight two essential elements in our definition of mobility, which are important for modeling, simulation, and assessment. The elements, they are the vehicle capability and ability to move from one place to another place in principle. And second, the vehicle capability and ability to perform its primary mission. Let's keep those uh, two elements in mind as they will be important for us to define autonomous mobility. On this slide, we continue on conventional vehicles. As our analysis indicated, modeling simulation and assessment of mobility is based on indices that can be split into five groups to characterize vehicle traction potential, engine power, grip properties of the vehicle running gear system, slippage and velocity, rod depth, turnability and stability of motion, vehicle ride and rollover. Uh, the number of indices to characterize mobility in all five groups can be 15 or even more. Uh, much work led by the Ground Vehicle System Center has been done in collaboration with other countries to turn developments in terrain mobility into the new NATO standard, namely known um, as the next generation NATO reference mobility model, uh, what is highlighted on this uh, slide. And uh, in June, there will be another terabyte in the digital event series that I can announce today. Dr. Bolling and George Mason, Dr. George Mason will be discussing uh, related technical issues um, uh, related to mobility of manned vehicles. Our concern today 
is the conclusions what we can withdraw from the technical definitions, indices, and numerous studies of manned vehicle dynamics with only one purpose, how we could move mobility science towards autonomous vehicle mobility. And we present those conclusions on the next slide. The first conclusion, and this is important, modeling simulation and assessment of conventional vehicle mobility is considered as an open loop system. This means that in mobility studies, terrain condition is specified, the vehicle terrain interaction is simulated using terrain mechanics and vehicle dynamics models. And we compute and analyze indices that we accepted for mobility assessment after we simulate the vehicle terrain interaction. Second conclusion, which can we, we can withdraw from these three items, uh, A, B, and C, is that mobility assessment is actually a post-processing, meaning that we may assess the mobility performance after a computational simulation. And we have two possible options for such assessment. Let's say we can say vehicle got stuck, immobilized, or vehicle was able to go through, and then we provide a quantitative estimates of mobility. Conclusion number three is that, is, um, that there is no feedback, um, you know, um, to improve mobility in real time when vehicle is on the go. As for the human driver in the loop, we can talk about two options. Option number one on the left, uh, I think it doesn't need any additional comments. And uh, for the uh, option number two, let me play this video. Um, the driver of this truck is a very experienced person you see the, the truck is moving in the beach with a very deep water. And um, it got completely immobilized. But when it's happening, the driver continues to throttle and spin the front wheels. You see the front wheel they spin. When spinning, the wheels, they are digging into the soft soil get into the next layer of the soil with a better grip. You see, it still cannot get out of this ditch, but in a second, the driver accelerates again and the vehicle can get out. Um, based on this analysis, uh, what I just provided on this slide, we can conclude on the following key characteristics of the man on, on manned vehicle mobility modeling simulation assessment, which are important for our discussion about autonomous mobility. Again, the modeling simulation and assessment is an open loop system that is simulated in given terrain conditions in, with mobility assessment as the post-processing, not in real time when vehicle is on the go. And there is no feedback control in simulation. Unmanned ground vehicles, um, they don't have such luxury to operate as an open loop system and the absence of real-time feedback control would be a failure for UGV mobility. UGVs operate within the framework illustrated on this slide by the, this two-block diagram. As you can see, artificial intelligence-based perception and planning in severe environment um, UGV should make a decision on its mobility, having or not having human in the loop. And UGV should implement the decision into control action. Here, UGV decision making and control is about two things actually. First, 
is the mobility state. How far I am from complete immobilization. Can I move in principle? And second thing is mobility performance. How good I am in my motion to fulfill my task. To have good answers to these questions, UGV should first have a potential to advance its mobility on a need basis, and second, have a technical ability to utilize such mobility potential and improve UGV mobility performance to its maximum. From this, we can say that the key characteristic of UGV mobility modeling simulation and assessment, which are important for understanding autonomous mobility can be named as following. Simulation framework is a closed loop system. We see this from this slide. Terrain conditions are given or not specified and should be identified and characterized by UGV exterioceptive and proprioceptive sensors. All processes undergo in real time, so to speak, on the go. Artificial intelligence and feedback controls are required. Online mobility performance optimizations is really needed. Our first discussion will be concerned with mobility optimization. Some other key features of autonomous mobility will be only touched on with regard to the current research with what we are doing in the Autonomous Vehicle Mobility Institute. Let's talk um, about some specifics of autonomous mobility model and simulation, which are important for mobility optimization. First, UGV should predict mobility margins meaning that UGV should assess its mobility state with regard to complete immobilization. Second, UGV should assess its mobility performance. And third, UGV should optimize its mobility performance while maintaining certain mobility margins. So logically, next questions we need to ask ourselves and find a good answer is what are the requirements for UGV indices to assess mobility margins and mobility performance? So we try to answer this question on the next slide. The mobility indices should be established as a set of technical parameters that results from real-time dynamics of the entire terrain interaction. Such technical parameters should be measurable and controllable in real time. These technical parameters should characterize UGV technical productivity, not energy efficiency, and enable assessment, optimization, and control of UGV mobility when the vehicle is on its mission. So now, um, please notice that we emphasize on technical productivity of UGV because the technical productivity directly relates to the fulfillment of the vehicle mission. And we remember that the mission fulfillment is an important component of the mobility definition. Now we're ready to introduce mobility margins and mobility performance indices. Mobility margins first. We defined um, um, the mobility margins um, using the peak friction coefficient and the current friction coefficient. Both friction, both friction coefficients uh, are represented by the ratio of the circumferential force of the wheel to the wheel normal reaction. For the peak friction coefficient, we use the maximum wheel force F allowable from the entire terrain grip. And for the current friction coefficient, the value of the wheel circumferential force is determined by the external resistance to motion. This diagram of a single wheel module 
explains the resistance to motion, which may include rolling resistance, gravity components, air drag, and inertia force. As seen from this graph on the left part of the uh, slide, the wheel has a sufficient mobility margins at T1 moment of time. This is indicated by a pretty big difference between the peak and uh, current friction coefficients. We consider that the wheel gets immobilized between T2 and T3 moments of time when the current friction coefficient uh, reaches the peak friction coefficient value. Such simple physics-based observations allowed us to introduce the wheel mobility index as we show it on the next slide. The wheel mobility index is equal to unity minus the ratio of the current value of the, um, uh, to the peak value of the circumferential force of the wheel. Definitely, the index ranges from 0 to 1. And the wheel is losing mobility when the index is zero. The next formula, it gives you vehicle mobility index so, uh, to characterize mobility margins of the entire vehicle. And we use this only to compare two vehicles uh, to each other. Uh, when we optimize uh, vehicle performance uh, of mobility, uh, I will be talking about this later, we all we determine mobility margins for each wheel. So in this approach, in this approach, uh, the wheel and then mobility performance is characterized by the circumferential force of the wheel Fx and the actual linear velocity, which takes into consideration the tire slippage. This is the Vx velocity. Both parameters characterize the technical productivity, and both parameters relate to the tire slippage as illustrated by these two equations in the frames. The slippage curve is typically a nonlinear function on deformable terrains. The value S delta C introduced here as the characteristic slippage. Um, which is the point on the curve when the curve starts changing rapidly to the nonlinear linearity, to its nonlinear um, area. The two equations in the frames, they are graphically shown on the next slide. And the components for each formula, you can see and read them from this slide. Here we have theoretical velocity at zero slippage. Um, angular velocity of the wheel and the rolling radius at zero slippage. Um, again, this is graphical illustration of those two equations. The first two graphs from the left, uh, they give you tire slippage and linear velocity as a function of the circumferential wheel force. As you can see, uh, those two parameters, when you get the product of the two of them, they characterize the mobility, uh, the productivity of the wheel. As seen from this graph on the right, there is only one point, uh, which is a diamond point over here, which corresponds to the maximum of this product. It's clear that the point is preferable. It means the best point for mobility performance on that terrain. Um, Slide number 15, it presents the same uh, graphs, but for the horizontal axis, x axis, here you see the slippage. We did this on purpose because slippage is very often is the control variable in the traction control systems. And um, as delta star uh, is named here as the optimal tire slippage, which corresponds to the maximum of the vehicle velocity of the product. Now we talk about uh, wheel mobility performance index. Um, 
to make this uh, product force and velocity index suitable to compare mobility performance of different wheels on different terrains, we can normalize the product as shown on the slide. This normalization leads us to what we call wheel mobility performance index. Indeed, the ratio of the wheel circumferential force to the normal reaction, this is the ratio Fx to Rz, to Rz, characterizes the potential of a wheel to transform the normal reaction into the traction. Let's say uh, the ratio is uh, 0.6. It means 60% of the uh, normal reaction can be converted into the traction. And the ratio of the velocities characterizes the drop of speed due to the tire slippage. Now we can conclude that the proposed index, uh, WMP, is always less than 1. The closer the nominator to the denominator, the better mobility performance of a wheel. Um, now let's um, analyze the component um, of the formula for the suitability for real-time assessment and control. Um, from the first look at the index, it's clear that all parameters in this equation can be measured or observed and then can be controlled. The wheel circumferential force is determined from the wheel torque in a conventional uh, vehicle with conventional um, power trains, it could be, the torque could be determined from uh, inverse vehicle dynamics control, for example. Uh, to do this, you need only to know uh, angular velocity and angular acceleration of the wheel. And in electric vehicles, the torque can be uh, obtained from the electrical current. Um, the normal reaction, Rz, can be observed, and I will be talking about this later in this presentation. Um, the rotational and linear speeds, they can be determined from vehicle sensors. And finally, the rolling radius can be experimentally determined as a function of the normal reaction and um, uh, inflation pressure in the tire and submitted for uh, computation, for example, as the lookup table. So all this, what I just listed, makes it attractive to extend wheel mobility index to the entire vehicle. And here we have it, um, uh, these two equations which characterize um, this uh, vehicle, mobility, vehicle mobility performance index. And um, you can see that the normal reaction, circumferential forces, velocities, rolling radius, tire slippages, they can be different and different wheels for obvious reasons shown on this slide. Terrain under the wheel can be different, not the same under the wheels. Characteristic of those power dividing units, as you can see this on this diagram of the vehicle, uh, they can be different. This 6x6 vehicle, it has five power dividing units to split power be between the wheels. And uh, the characteristic uh, def definitely impacts uh, uh, slippages and circumferential forces of the wheels. And suspensions at different wheels may have different characteristics too. Um, having said this, we can begin to formulate the uh, performance optimization problem. The nominator of the objective function is the total resistance to vehicle motion, which is not controlled. Uh, this, to uh, this total resistance to motion includes rolling resistance, vehicle gravity components, drop of cool, and all others listed on this slide. Uh, for this reason, we can use denominator as the objective function that should be minimized to determine the optimal set of tire slippages. And tire slippages, they are certainly constrained. For the constraints, we use the characteristic slippages. Um, you, see, you remember this S delta C 
which is a point on the slippage curve when the, uh, the curvature of the slippage curve begins drastically increasing plus some kind of delta which allow us uh, to look for optimal slippages in the non-linear, really non-linear area of the, um, of the curve. In paper number one published in the Journal of Thermomechanics, you can find all mathematics we did to prove the existence of the optimal power to slippages as a unique, a globally optimal. For this purpose, we use the Lagrange multiplier method and the Hessian theory. As um, the analysis proved, the maximum of the vehicle mobility performance index is observed at different, not equal, slippages at the different wheels. And I can illustrate this graphically for you on this slide, the three-dimensional plots illustrate vehicle performance, uh, mobility performance index for a 4x4 four four vehicle, uh, number one curve with the uh, number one line, blue line with the optimal power distribution between the wheels with optimal slippages, second uh, for the vehicle with open differential in the transfer case, and number three is the same vehicle with locked differential in the transfer case. As you can see, the mobility performance index of the vehicle with conventional driveline system takes lower values than the index of the vehicle with optimal distribution of power between the wheels that provides the optimal tire slippages. We conducted computational simulations in different conditions as they shown here on this slide. The vehicle was simulated in the transportation uh, with no dropper pool or traction mode with dropper pool on different surfaces, horizontal or climbing a hill, and um, uh, with um, homogeneous terrain under the wheels or with the split terrain under the front and rear wheels. Um, on those uh, four quadrants, A, B, C, and D, uh, we illustrate computational results on different split terrains in the traction mode with dropper pull force when the front and rear wheels uh, they are on different terrains. For the sake of time, uh, I comment upon the quadrant A only. As you can see, mobility index is a uh, blue curve is maximum at the optimal tire slippages at a certain uh, dropper pull, right? When the differential in the transfer case locked, we have two cases, case number two and case number three. Uh, number two is with zero kinematic discrepancy, and number three is with zero with non-zero kinematic discrepancy, meaning that theoretical velocities of the front and rear wheels, they are not the same. Um, there are no simulation results for the open differential in transfer case. The reason is that when the, the uh, vehicle with the open differential drops its velocity very quickly when the dropper pool is increasing and the uh, vehicle is actually losing uh, mobility, get immobilized, completely immobilized. Some interesting results mm. were obtained for the transportational mode on flat fleet terrains. Um, here we simulated two cases. Number one is uh, terrain is softer under the front wheels. The snow meadow uh, in, the, in this um, column. And second, the terrain is softer under the rear wheels. You see snow under the rear wheels here and meadow is under the front wheels. And now, please take a look at the ratio of the optimal slippages when the front wheels move on snow. You see that the maximum mobility performance is achieved if the front wheels are disconnected from the driveline system. It means, in this 
in this case, vehicle 4x2 behaves better in terms of mobility performance than vehicle 4x4. However, when the rear wheels move on snow, the vehicle should be in the 4x4 operational mode uh, for the best mobility performance. Similar computational results uh, we received on uh, other, uh, other configurations of the terrain. Uh, analysis of the mobility margins show that the margins are different for different driveline systems of the vehicle. You see here WMI1 and WMI2. This is for the front wheel, this is for the rear wheels. However, the numerical values of the margins on the terrain under consideration, they are pretty big. You see the values. And for the uh, optimal power distribution between the wheels when the slippages are optimal and mobility is performance is maximum, the mobility margins in those terrains they're pretty big between 64 and 97 percent. We see that the vehicle is far away from uh, complete immobilization. So what kind of conclusions we can make on this uh, vehicle mobility optimization process? We made uh, many interesting observations and conclusions. You can find them in the paper. On this slide, uh, we emphasize only two findings. On homogeneous terrains, the mobility performance indices of the vehicle with conventional driveline system and optimal tire slippages, they are close to each other. However, this is not the case for split terrains. We can say that the mobility optimization is really needed and should be recommended in severe terrain conditions. In some terrain conditions, vehicle in the 4x2 mode performs better than in the 4x4 mode. And um, um, experimental and verification and validation as we know, is a necessary attribute in any research. For, EN, for VNV, we use the experimental results which were obtained from previous uh, tests of this farm tractor. The experiments were conducted by Dr. Strigono with my participation in many tests. You can find more details on VNV analysis in the paper, um, paper number two. Here, I just mentioned that the tractor was tested in, uh, in the mode 4x4 and 4x2. We varied characteristics of the 4x4 driveline by changing the gears in the transfer case and changing the thickness of the gasket between the transfer case and the tractor transmission. Uh, this was done to change the kinematic discrepancy. It means to change the uh, theoretical velocity of the front and rear wheel. Next slide is very interesting and important, I believe. Uh, this is as a next turn in our talk, we would like to relate the outcomes of the mobility performance research, what we did to vehicle energy efficiency. Uh, I would say it took uh, for researchers almost 70 years to debate and agree on the maximum energy efficiency that the maximum is observed when the tire slippages are the same, equal to each other, regardless of terrain condition. I think the first publication on this technical problem can be referred to 1960s. This slide uh, presents uh, simulation results of a uh, by, uh, 8x8 by eight truck with a total mass, gross mass, about 40 ton, uh, and the simulations, they were done in 17 different terrain conditions. Optimization of the power distribution between the wheels resulted in the increase of energy efficiency of this truck by 3 to 12% depending on terrain conditions. Uh, this was a PhD study to analyze and experimentally confirmed that the maximum energy efficiency of electric vehicles 
with individual wheel electric motors is also observed at the same slippages at all tires. The experiments, they were conducted in the National Soil Dynamics Lab with Dr. Tom Way's help and participation. Um, on the left uh, video, this is the video, um, the tires experience the same slippages you can see this from the rotational speed of the tires. In the middle, you can see that the rear wheels demonstrate larger slippages than the front wheel. And finally, on this uh, right uh, side, uh, excuse me, right side video, we see that the front wheels, they have greater slippages than the rear wheels. Looks like the front wheels, they try to run away from the rear wheels. Energy efficiency computed and experimental determined show that the maximum is in the case when the tire slippages equal to each other and the zero discrepancy between the front and the rear wheels uh, and zero uh, kinematic discrepancy between the front and rear wheels is zero. The total DC motor current um, con consumed by all the wheels is minimum when the slippages they are the same. So uh, on this slide we make conclusion which is important for control design. On plot A on the left and plot B in the middle, you see the vehicle mobility performance indices and running gear efficiency as a function of the dropper pool FD. The two maximums they occur they occur at different values of the dropper pool. Um, if you plot them at the same curve of the energy efficiency of the vehicle, you see that the red circle on the curve of the running gear efficiency indicates the best efficiency at the dropper pool of 15 kilonewtons. And uh, the best performance, mobility performance, is observed when the uh, dropper pool is close to 20 kilonewtons. Based on the outcomes of the presented research work, we can conclude that the control of UGV mobility and UGV energy efficiency should be based on different algorithms. Indeed, the algorithms should select between mobility and energy efficiency, which of them should be controlled in a specific situation. Um, for military applications, it may uh, mean that what you have, what you want to save, the vehicle or the fuel. Um, with these findings, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the control. This would be another two sessions uh, in the digital event series. Uh, to talk about autonomous control design. I highlight here what we are designing for mobility and energy efficiency controls in the vehicle, in our institute, Autonomous Vehicle Mobility Institute. The controls, they are either model-based or model-less based. And we're designing what we call agile tire slippage control, which is very fast, precise, and preemptive control. Um, I illustrate this by referring to conventional traction control system illustrated with this uh, white color curve. The uh, response time of those systems typically between 100 and 120 milliseconds. With such long response time, the wheel begins to spin, as you can see from this demonstration. And again, if it's the military vehicle has become a good target uh, when it's not moving. Uh, we're trying to reduce the response time to 40-60 milliseconds 
which is close to the longitudinal relaxation time constant. Uh, to illustrate the longitudinal uh, relaxation time constant or relaxation of the tire, um, I put here this video with this green color car with the wrinkle tire. Uh, it takes the tire between 40 and 60 milliseconds to deform and develop the force in the tire patch. So it means if we reduce this time um, response to this uh, 40, 60 milliseconds, looks like we can control the tire before it begins to spin. A few words about the uh, normal reaction observation. A too big normal reaction caused by, for example, active suspension control may limit vehicle mobility. Indeed, if you want to stabilize the frame of the vehicle by controlling suspension, the normal reaction can drastically go up and it can get close to the bearing capacity of soil. The vehicle can lose mobility for that reason. And too small normal reaction may make worse vehicle steerability and rollover definitely would be um, concerned. Uh, we're designing normal reaction observers with a terrain-free um, system. It means it doesn't matter what kind of terrain is under the wheel. We can get uh, the uh, normal reaction um, observed values in real time, having only one sensor, which is measuring the suspension trail. And this is, uh, we're close to the end. And uh, for the conclusions, again, um, I would like to reiterate that modeling simulation and assessment of conventional vehicle mobility has been considered as an open loop process. The indices used for mobility assessment, they are suited for the post hoc analysis. Um, for unmanned ground vehicles, the model and simulation and assessment of mobility should be considered as a real-time closed-loop process. To satisfy such requirements, we propose the mobility, vehicle mobility performance index, which can be measured and controlled in real time. And um, the mobility performance index can serve, we believe, as the primary index to maximize mobility performance. Unlike energy efficiency, the maximum mobility performance occurs at different values of tire slippages at different wheels, regardless of terrain conditions. And the mobility performance index is well suited for agile, real-time control of UGV on severe terrain. More details can be found in the reference papers. And with that, I thank you all for your attendance of this meeting and patience, and we'll be happy to take some questions. Thank you. Right, thank you for um, the, the presentation, Vladimir. Um, so we, we move on to the next stage, which is question and answers. If um, I'm having a look at the chat to see if there are any questions coming through, and we don't have many so far, if at all. So if you would like to um, ask a question, could you please either type into the uh, chat or if you put your hand up, if you go down to the, uh, the toolbar and you highlight, uh, you, you hover your mouse over uh, the chat, you'll see a raise hand. So if you click on the raise hand, we could identify you and then um, somebody could switch on their video and audio and ask the question. Um, so while we get some response there, then um, there's one one thing that sort of it's just a more of a more of a general one really, um, Vladimir, and that was that different vehicles in 
for different uses will will have very often quite different requirements for for operation. Uh, the, the, the obvious example is agricultural tractors versus military vehicles, particularly military vehicles in convoy, where with agricultural yeah. tractors, then terrain damage, it has to be minimized, slips may actually be quite low. And one of the criteria of interest is the actual performance of the drawbar for ground engaging implements. So the tractive efficiency um, as separate to the engine efficiency to in the drive line is 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 um, very often the key whereas with military convoys uh, the the major criteria might be that the last vehicle in the convoy has to be able to complete the journey um have you got any thoughts about some of the discussion how you would actually uh focus some of your 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 analysis towards one of these areas or the other and of course construction vehicles may actually have rather different requirements because if they do become mobile immobilized for example it's not difficult to find another machine to to right. uh, to um get it from 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 where it's being stuck into into operation again i don't even got any thoughts about the, the different application of the analysis to different groups of of, of machinery yeah, Alex, it's a great question, and actually not one, but a lot of questions, and we can talk about this another hour probably. Uh, uh, in in our papers, number one and two, we analyzed a little bit different areas of applications for off-road vehicles, what you just named them. Uh, construction machinery, they very often move with very low speed, uh, right, this is one of the requirements, Farm tractors they should not damage the uh, soil, definitely, for yield. Mm -hmm. uh, so different requirements. We analyze them and then we say, now we understand this is all problems, technical problems and questions. We leave them aside and we are doing what we have done and what I presented related to off-road trucks and uh, some military applications. Mm -hmm. um, however, Next, what I would like to say is that we really think about uh, what the technical problems you raised, specifically about the damage what uh, off-road mobility brings to the soil. And uh, in one of our papers, not listed here, I think, we uh, introduced um, uh, a characteristic which takes into consideration the soil damage. And we just mentioned um, that this can be also included into the optimization process for specific vehicles. So we thought about this and I know several other publications in uh, different countries in Europe, uh, they also highlighted the need of this. I also know, and um, uh, this, was, this was done by the way uh, uh, in ISTVS, so we had several papers in our conferences from several courses that they say about the damage what uh, a military vehicle brings on proven grounds to the soil so how to restore the properties of the soil but again um, this is all all open questions uh, with no answers at this moment but again uh, the index what we proposed can be uh, used for mobility performance uh, assessment and optimization for off-road trucks this is for sure for farm tractors it also can be used if productivity is the point uh, all um, uh, you know all requirements for the soil potential damage could be included as the constraints uh, into the optimization this would be a brief answer to your very big comprehensive question, but it's really, really a good question. Thank you. Okay, right, thank you. We've got a, a question for uh, Naren from Narendra uh, Kota, and uh, it's two questions. The first one is, um, are there any effects of snow terrain uh, studied? And secondly, um, anything where you've involved trailers 
and uh, other attachments on mobility. So the first one is the, the how much how much data you've got access to, which includes particularly snow uh, and other terrain. Um, as a first question, please. Um, I'm not a snow person per se. Okay. We have with Corel uh, excellent uh, researchers uh, who do research on snow, and we have research in other countries, researchers in other countries who spent years and years studying type of snow and interaction with the snow. I am a user of that research. I just use that research uh, for computational simulations. Uh, specifically, I use the rolling resistance on snow um, data. I use the slippage curves on snow data for, for the optimization purposes. But uh, personally, I did not do any uh, research related to studying snow and behavior of vehicle on snow. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, the second part of the question was, um, have you investigated uh, any situations where there are attachments such as trailers or sledges or uh, anything uh, else? Um, trailers, uh, we did a lot of research for highway heavy duty trucks with um, uh, tractor and semi-trailer or trailer configurations. <laughs> And we did this for, again, for uh, energy efficiency, for productivity of the trucks, and for turnability and stability of motion. This for on-road conditions. For off-road conditions, we also did combinations, let's say, vehicle, it could be a farm tractor and a trailer. And we studied turnability, stability of motion on soft terrain. Specifically, um, if you bring power to the wheels of the trailer. Yeah. So uh, this a big, big question. Several uh, PhD uh, studies uh, have been done. Um, I believe the first one, I know it was somewhere in 1980s, as I recall. Uh, but again, we did this. Um, uh, this study uh, when you have additional drive axle attached to the to a farm tractor which makes the farm um, with the um, i forgot the word um, when you have articulation between the third axle and the second axle of the tractor. And then you can put a trailer on the drive axle and you have to uh, make sure that there is no discrepancy. Uh, the window the at the top. Uh, if you come back, then that's okay. Can you see me? Yeah, I can hear you again now, yeah. Okay. Um, so I was talking that uh, there is a problem how to split power between the three axle of the vehicle when you have a farm tractor with additional drive axle. Yeah. So how to make it, uh, make sure that there is no uh, pull and uh, push forces between the links. So how to control the power distribution in the real, in real time and how to make sure that the vehicle is stable uh, in the straight line motion and is stable when making a turn. So those type of research uh, we have done and we have experience in that. Yeah, I, I suppose that there, there could be more complication where, for example, an agricultural tractor with trailers is collecting uh, produce from the field and then on soft terrain and then going on to hard roads um, right. for the main part of the, of, of the journey. So we could get within um, one scenario, there could be a number of, 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 of different examples of where the, where the conditions change. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly right. Um, and again, it was in use and um, farm tractors, for this reason, they have increased velocities for the transportation mode. Uh, when they operate on um, dirt road or even asphalt roads, when they're transporting um, uh, some goods from the, again, from the field 
to storage. This is definitely for sure. Um, a very interesting issue, uh, 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 an interesting point here is uh, should this tractor have um, a suspension at the rear wheels or not? There was a PhD study you know, many years ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, from from sort of old investigations, the uh, um, the wheel load should be more constant at least. Um, right. Whether that uh, that may come into to uh, um, making the ride more even and the power distribution more even. But uh, um, well, I, I thought, uh, is there anybody who's in the audience who would actually like to join us? We don't have any more written questions in the chat that I can see. I'll just spin up to the top and back, but I think at the moment we no, we we don't have any more questions. But is there anyone in the audience who would just like to ask the question? Uh, um, maybe, uh, maybe Alex, I can ask uh, a yeah, question. Thanks, uh, thanks Massimo. Uh, if you'd like to go ahead, yeah. Before uh, so we give some more time to our audience to think if if they have something, uh, some additional question for Vladimir. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, my question, Vladimir, was uh, if you could uh, give us some uh, practical hints on how you uh, factor the actual slip control uh, on an actual uh, control system. Uh, what I mean is that uh, when I think about uh, the problem for a moving vehicle, uh, I think of having, let's say, a target forward speed based on on the mission uh, on the translation i have to uh to do and uh of course uh, i will have to uh, overcome a certain resistant force uh, which as you showed also in your slide uh, is not controllable that's given by uh the terrain conditions the grip slope uh, etc so uh, given that those two uh, one variable is one of my targets. Uh, the other one, uh, I cannot control. So uh, you come up with some optimizations that tell you uh, what the optimal slip would be. But in practice, uh, slip is not an independent variable. So uh, how do you uh, put those things together in, uh, in a practical way? Uh, control application, if if this m makes any sense, I hope. Oh, yeah, definitely. It makes a lot of sense. But let's start with the model and simulation first. Uh, you see, the vehicle is moving in a given terrain, let's say, and you have the total circumferential, uh, uh, you have the total resistance to motion. Let's say this is the amount of um, resistance to motion that the vehicle should overcome. Now the question is how to split this uh, total circumferential force between the wheels in order to cover this total resistance to motion. And this would give you the optimal slippages at any moment of time. Does it make sense, right? Yes, absolutely. Right. So now you have the forces, you have the torques, you have the slippages. This is for simulation, right? But then uh, when you go to the real world, and you start operating this in real time, so you have some problems and you have to start problems related to the to building a control system which controls the slippages, right? Yeah. So, because again, you don't know the resistance to motion. It's not given. You don't know you, what you have under the wheels, right? Yes. So, and in this case, you have to split the slippages and control the slippages between the wheels when you throttle the vehicle. Then you have on top of this, you have a controller which controls the slippages according to the vehicle mobility performance to make the mobility performance maximum. And again, you are doing this without knowing any resistance to motion. You're just specifying the slippage uh, your uh, power with your supplying to the wheels is uh, pretty big, it's enough. Your engine would never ever die uh, on today's vehicle, right? Yeah. Uh, it's near, it's not in like the 1920s, right? When you push the throttle and the vehicle dies. 
uh, engine dies. So you can move through. The problem is when you're moving through the unknown terrain conditions, how to get the slippages, uh, the best configuration of the slippages, the best set of the slippages. And to do this, you can use the vehicle mobility performance and optimize it online. Makes sense, right? Right. And next, uh, and next point, what I want to bring in, it should be in real time or even faster than real time, as we uh, typically say. So to do this, you have to have a great sensors. And we are not very much satisfied with the sensors what we have today on the vehicles. Uh, let's say uh, the whole effect sensor to get the angular speed of the wheel, uh, it has a latency about 200 milliseconds. We did this experiment and we found out. So 200 milliseconds, your controller doesn't have any information about what's going on with the motion. So definitely we need advance, we need to advance those sensors and get uh, the signal about angular velocity right away. And we also need some other sensors on, uh, on the vehicle, what I cannot talk at this moment because it's uh, IP, it's <laughs> should be protected then we come here and we'll talk right but again when you have those advanced sensors when you have this online uh, mobility performance optimization in real time or faster than real time then you can control sleep which is when you just throttle the vehicle without even knowing what's going on at each wheel because it will be finding those optimal configuration, optimal sets of slippages in real time. This is what I would respond to your great question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Probably linked to that a little bit, uh, Vladimir, um, as you were going through on slide number eight, you've got two um, vehicles there and one of them has got several sensors. I don't know if you could go to slide number eight. In and slide you, number eight? Yeah, you were referring uh, with, with Massimo about sensors, and um, you, you're showing a vehicle there with a number of sensors. Are there a minimum required number of sensors, and then extra sensors which will give you um, you know, further control. Is there anything you'd like to say about the required sensors um, um, to, to be so able to do the analysis? First, right. First, we try to utilize the sensor, the existing sensors, as much as possible, not to bring any additional cost to the vehicle. This is number one. But uh, number mm -hmm. two is if, the, if a sensor does not um, satisfy the requirements for agile tire dynamics and control, we say we have to move to a different sensor. Um, second, uh, uh, again, we try to bring sensors only on a need basis. Uh, let's say when we talk about um, uh, tire slippage control, we definitely need to have one more additional sensor, but hopefully I will talk about the sensor next year at this event, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, another sensor, what I would like to mention, is a sensor of, to measure the travel of the suspension. Uh, when the control arms goes up and down in the vehicle, we need just a potentiometer, a very simple sensor, to measure the travel. And based on this travel and based on the mathematics we have, we can observe, we can predict and estimate the normal reaction in the tire patch. You see, we don't need to measure the sinkage of the tire. We don't need to measure any deflections of the tire or deflection of the soil. We don't need any cameras. We just need one potentiometer to measure the travel of the suspension. And based on this travel, we can tell, tell you what is the normal reaction in the tire patch. And that normal reaction is very important uh, to estimate rolling resistance, to estimate, uh, again, potential immobilization of the vehicle. As I said, uh, when you have a semi-active or active suspension and you are controlling the um, stabilized motion of the frame, 
you have, let's say, to have a vehicle uh, frame always horizontal. Whatever terrain you have, the vehicle frame is always horizontal. In this mm -hmm. case, the normal reaction at the wheel will be drastically going up. So if it goes up, the pressure in the tire patch goes up, and the pressure comes close to the bearing capacity of the soil. So it means you have you might have problems with mobility. At the same time, if uh, we need to know the normal reaction to see what's going on with the steer, steer in your vehicle. If the normal reaction is about 20% of the static load on the tire, the steering of the vehicle would be in problem. And finally, rollover, to, to see what you have the, for the normal reaction and how far you are from the rolling over is also very important, again, for mobility. As we saw from the, those definitions, what I presented in the very beginning uh, on, on the slide. Okay. Right, thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions specifically in the chat. Um, you, you've referred to the, uh, on the first page of your slides, there is a list of, of, of references. We can put those into, uh, when we um, upload the info into the resource initiative page uh, and put a link into the YouTube page, then, uh, Oh, hang on a minute. We have, we do have a question. I'll come back to what I was saying in a second. It's no. David, Dave White, who's who's there. Could you want to switch on your your camera and, and video, David? Hello, David. Hello. I was yeah. just thinking, Vladimir, about the a little short video that you had about the vehicle driving along under those arduous conditions, and then it was only the skill of the driver. Who then reversed back and then managed to get over the uh, the instruction? Have you applied? And, and, and if that had been a totally autonomous vehicle, then I'm guessing it would have actually have got stuck. But have you then applied your uh, control system to such a vehicle to see whether it would automatically be able to get itself out of that situation? without the, um, the very skilled driver? You see, it's a great question, but I think we are far away from that point when we can make it possible. Um, probably no, in our dream we can do this now. But again, uh, uh, again, autonomy, it has so many different aspects. Autonomy stack of perception, uh, planning and control it's a big, big technical issue. And Dr. Gorsuch, he would be here, he would tell you much more about uh, the work what's going on now to develop in those uh, autonomous steps uh, to, to, to do all this, to include all possible applications, including what, uh, David, you had just uh, yeah. mentioned. Yeah. Uh, it's a very hard uh, issue, and again, uh, I don't even know how many sensors the vehicle should have in order to get out of this situation, out of this trouble. But it's definitely a big technical problem, and we're definitely trying to address this. And um, uh, you saw this on the slide. Uh, just I put this on purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Just thinking on that one, Vladimir, if uh, the example that, that, that David White was giving you, if you have a, a vehicle in that situation that understands that it can't, it can't come up with an answer, could you not just switch to a remote driver? You have a, a, a connection to, to somebody that, that calls up a remote driver in emergencies and the remote driver takes over for that short period. To, mm -hmm. to to drive the vehicle and then return to the to the uh, automation um, I would um, uh, answer the, in your question in two ways one is definitely uh, a driver an operator can be in the loop on the loop or out of the loop so in the loop is continuously you know driving the vehicle on the loop, the driver comes to the driving process on a need basis, as you said. 
But uh, probably what I would do is I would try not to get the vehicle into this situation. And mobility margins and mobility performance, I think that they would allow us to do that. If vehicle in online mode estimating the mobility margins, it means how far I am from a complete immobilization. And this vehicle is see that the mobility margins, they are becoming critical. So the vehicle should go backward and on the way to replan the trajectory path, keeping in mind what kind of map, go or no go map the vehicle has in its possession. And then get out of the, not to get into the trouble, to the ditch with water, but to go around. This would be probably a better solution for this. Mm -hmm. But again, if you are already over there, what you are saying to have a driver definitely would help. Okay. Oh, we've got, um, we have quite a long question here. I'll have a quick look and see if I can summarize it from Charles. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll read, I'll start reading and, and see if we can find a point to, to stop. Uh, as it was pointed out earlier in the talk, autonomous mobility is a function of platform planning and control. The cross-country mobility modeling community has identified that geometry, e.g. large changes in elevation, affect vehicle cross-country mobility. To me, it seems that platform mobility, performance for autonomous platforms, is thus dependent on your platform choice of action, e.g. heading into an area of high resistance versus uh, high uh, geometric variation. Likewise, vehicle immobilization could also be correlated to geometry of the scene high centering of chassis, exiting a ditch, etc. Uh, would you mind providing some comments on how environment scene geometry impacts vehicle performance in your modeling, such as the mobility state? Mm -hmm. Do you want um, to, did you get yeah, most of that or shall I? Yeah, I, I try to answer as much as I understand the question. Yeah. And then we will see if there wouldn't be any other following questions. Uh, first, everything what was just said is uh, not in the scope of today's presentation. This is what I would like to emphasize. Uh, we are talking today about a little bit different uh, uh, technical issues, fundamentals for autonomous mobility, but not for implementation of autonomous mobility in different topological uh, areas and so on and so forth. But talking in those about uh, the question itself, I would say that uh, again, any autonomous vehicle would never go to fulfill a mission without some kind of preliminary work that should be done with operators. The vehicle should be uh, should plan its path, uh, you know, based on the mission to get from A to B and B in point in, and arrive at point B at certain time. And on the way from point B, vehicle would be uh, planning in advance, would be planned based on the go on not go maps, the way from A to B, the most, the best way to get over there. And that definitely diff different topological, uh, you know, uh, obstacles, hills or obstacles on the way, or forest or some kind of other, uh, you know, um, uh, type of uh, obstacles, manned or uh, uh, natural obstacles would be taken into consideration. This is for sure. The other question is when vehicle is already on the move. And all of a sudden, the weather condition changed. And the vehicle realizes that it's not possible 
for this vehicle to go through this uh, pathway because of the terrain changes under the rain the soil became so soft and the mobility and vehicle cannot go through because as soon as the vehicle gets over there the margins get critical values so on the way the vehicle should be capable to replan based on the map which is given to the vehicle to replane or having a human in the loop to replane the way to go from A to B, making sure that the arrival time will never ever change. Mm. So this is what I would answer to this question. But again, it's a great question and uh, probably different uh, solutions could be found for this, but this is what, um, what I would respond. Thank you. Right. Well, thank you. Um, as, as I was saying before, the uh, the list of the references that you referred to in the slides, um, we can put that up onto the uh, website when we upload the, the video and so on. And if there are any of the slides or, or presentation that we can put up as a PDF, then we'd, we'd love to do that. Um, so um, we thank you very much for the really interesting uh, presentation, which I think has got a lot for people to think about and a lot of areas for uh, you know future future work and, and, and discussion and I'm just seeing some hands coming up I think they're saying thank you hopefully um, I'm not yeah they, yeah I think that's just hands floating across my screen from somewhere but uh, um, I'm not sure what they are. Um, so thank you very much indeed for a great presentation there's plenty of to think about and yeah. I'm sure a lot of people will start thinking about things when they uh, start thinking about this further on. Um, I did note in the middle of your presentation, you did refer that there was room for um, at least two or three further presentations um, in, in, in the future. And we'd gladly give you an open invite to, to yeah. come back and to, uh, yeah. uh, to carry on Right, I would definitely extend this invitation to our research staff members in our Autonomous Vehicle Mobility Institute, who are definitely good professionals in control development, mm. and they can do this much better than I. Uh, I definitely invite them, please, and let me know whenever you want them to have, and we will can plan this uh, this year or next year. Um, and uh, as my last word, if I may, I would like to thank all the audience for coming today, for your time you spent with us. I would be open to answer any questions offline. Please shoot me your questions and we'll be happy to talk with you on Zoom or any other options. And uh, thank you very much to ISTVS team who organized all this and uh, special thanks to all my PhD students and all my colleagues and friends who work with me because everything what I presented is a big, big teamwork. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, well, well, thank you very much indeed, Vladimir, and, and uh, um, for all the input into this. I think it's uh, it, it's gone really well. Thank you.